on the science last night. Last night. A, ver a very warm welcome to our first session this morning, to you early birds. Um, I'm really looking forward to this session. It's called Moonshot Inventions, Staying True to the Needs of, planet, uh, of People and the Planet. Um, we have a fantastic panel awaiting us. Um, for all of those uh, of you joining um, from around the world, um, I doubt there are that many from the United States, but I, I'm sure there are some from, from Asia. For those from the United States, night owls, welcome. And for all those here in Europe, please submit your questions online. Um, I would really, before we get going though, and I, I ask uh, Sophie to introduce the panel, I would like to um, thank Siemens uh, Energy for their support of this event. Uh, we're very grateful for them, and we're just going to play a short video. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in welcoming our panelists for this morning's session. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Bomi, I think you can you feel free okay, to sit sure. there so that we, can, <laughs> yeah. we are socially <laughs> distant as we should yeah. be. Sure. Good morning. So as Stephen said, this is a really session we are very excited about. Uh, every one of those innovators sitting on stage, plus we have um, our innovators, Benjamin, joining us remotely, who should be uh, joining us in the background, have been selected as part of the climate um, innovation initiative that the New York Times has been creating. Every one of them have been uh, gone through a process of evaluation and selection by Edinburgh University. And the key criteria that we were, they've been uh, assessed against were scalability, breaking into new markets, level of ambition, potential for community impact, and social benefits. So first of all, congratulations for uh, your selection and thank you so much for being here. So, Moonshot Innovation. The, the conversation we're going to have today is really discuss about the potential for those innovations to really stay true to the needs of people and planet. There is a lot of those innovations that never make the light of day. 
Some are seen to be too futuristic, others simply lack of finance, others address needs that haven't yet made it to the mainstream discussion about climate. And so really what we want to discuss today is where are those innovations most needed? What conditions need to be met for this innovation to reach the level of scale that uh, the climate crisis calls for, but also the impact uh, that they can potentially have on the um, issues they're trying to address? So what I'm going to start is going a uh, little popcorn round robin, asking e each of you to Tell me a few words about your innovation and in what sense, in your view, uh, your innovation is staying true to the needs of the people and the planet. And maybe Yasmin, I'll start with you. Sure. Thank you for, invite, for inviting me. I'm really, really very happy to be sharing the stage with uh, fellow climate innovators. So I'm here for SMO Solar Process. It's a modular uh, solar-powered uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and utilization technology that turns any type of carbon-based waste into uh, green hydrogen and industry feedstocks that recycle the carbon from the waste. So uh, we're able to offer a decentralized uh, potential and product to people all around the world, even in low infrastructure location. So what is a game changer in this technology is that we are completely energy autonomous and modular, so easy to set up. And we use local waste, so it can be wastewater sludge, it can be invasive uh, biomass like we have in the Caribbean with Sargassum today. It can be domestic waste, plastics, so it's a solution to recycle uh, plastics. And we can um, turn out a profitable and valuable products. So green hydrogen is one of the best way to reduce emissions in the future. And we're able to offer that to communities around the world at below uh, two euros per kg with this technology. So um, what we do is we're trying to speed up access of this technology to people that are far away, that would pay a lot more for this product and that uh, would have a much later access to this type of technology. And Yasmin, in terms of reach for the moment, what is your geographical reach with that innovation? So we've had a full-scale prototype in Morocco since COP22 in, uh, in 2016, and we are having our first commercial deployment, one in Croatia and one in Guadeloupe, to explore the full scale of uh, this technology. Great, thank you. I'll continue the popcorn round. Bomi, I'll go to you next. Okay. Um, so I co-founded BioLoop. We do, we'll run a biorefinery in Lagos, Nigeria. We take organic waste and we process it using insects. The black so we're soldier, using? Insects, the black, insect. soldier fly, black soldier fly larvae. They're very efficient in converting organic matter into their own biomass. And so we, use, we leverage that to, as a waste management technique. And we, our outputs are fertilizer, which we take from the residue from their feeding, insect protein, and there's also energy. Um, because the, that fertilizer can be used as feedstock for biogas and digester. Um, we, I found it valuable because 70% you know, of the cost of running a livestock farm in Nigeria comes from feed. You know, and a lot of that is imported. A lot of it comes from fish meal, soy. And for a country that's dealing with you know, malnutrition and rising rampant food in inflation, it's important to have you know, alternatives, alternatives that are economically and you know, environmentally sustainable. So that's why I found it valuable, and you know, it's been an interesting journey so far. And in terms of, again, where are you at in mm -hmm. the process of deploying that innovation? Okay. Um, we're at, we have one pilot facility in Lake, outside Lagos, um, and we started operating in about March, and we have plans to expand further and you know, integrate a bit more, but that's where we are, integrate with software and become more tech-enabled, but now we're just that one pilot facility. Great, thank you, Rami. Brandy, can I go to you next? Yeah, How is your innovation addressing the needs of people and planet? Yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm the co-founder of Farm From A Box, and we've developed a clean tech powered infrastructure for smallholder localized farming. And it's, it's easy to think of in terms of how we are feeding uh, the planet and people because three out of four farmers globally are smallholder localized farmers. 
They're on the front lines of climate change, and yet technological innovation and capital is not necessarily going to them. So we're really working to fill that gap and be able to provide this, again, as, as Yasmin said, decentralized, deliverable, off-grid infrastructure that can really help strengthen what their localized production is. And our systems include you know, off-grid power, solar-powered pumping, uh, water filtration, drip irrigation to be able to support and stabilize crop production, and an internal cold storage system, all backed by data as well. And in terms of reach, where are you at? Uh, we're currently within the US and also East Africa, and we're just starting to expand out into Liberia as well. So we serve individual and commercial farmers, um, and just recently we started doing more volume supply chain initiatives as well so that we could really impact uh, at scale. Great, thank you. Benjamin, if I can go to you, if you could um, tell us a bit about your innovation and, and its impact on people and planet. Thank you, Sophie, and uh, thank you for having me here. So at Apollo Agriculture, we support farmers uh, and to, to be able to make more money. And uh, that is by providing these farmers with everything that they need to succeed. And as you know, that 80% uh, of farmers in Africa are smallholders. But also to reach to these smallholder farmers is hard because most smallholder farmers are very rural, they are very fragmented and very small scale. And when you are approaching it from a conventional business way of using people and paper business model, it simply doesn't work. And it's just because of high acquisition and servicing cost, because farmers are hard to reach, but also low lifetime values of these customers. Because, for example, you, might, you, you may need almost 3,000 smallholder farmers to be able to earn the same revenue that will be able to earn, to earn from one farmer in the central United States. As a result, most businesses have been able to really struggle to be able to scale. So at Apollo, we have been able to build the core technology that help us to be able to address some of these challenges and be able to deliver the tools that these farmers need so that they can be able to succeed in terms of increasing productivity, but also addressing some of the climate change challenges, but also be able to make more money. So we use satellites that help us to be able to see everywhere. We also use machine learning that help us to better understand our customers. And also we use mobile phones and mobile money that help us to communicate and transact with any customer from anywhere. And all these have really helped us to drive down the cost of acquisition and also better data that help us to make better credit decisions and be able to deliver these proven products that helps the farmers to maximize their production in a truly scalable and profitable way. Great, thank you, Benjamin. And last but not least, at least Hank. Hi, my name is Hank Torbert. I'm the chair of SunAmp. SunAmp is the leading provider of thermal storage solutions. We operate currently in 17 countries. We uh, effectively create a, a heat battery that can be used to provide and store heat. It's very simple. We can actually replace all of the water heaters on the planet through our effort. We fully commercialized it. We are selling the product uh, and uh, producing 500 to 1,000 units per month. Fully operating here in Scotland, we uh, are a great example of a commercialization partnership with the University of Edinburgh from concept all the way to the market. And above and beyond all of that, I think we are a good indication of how you can have a global, global partnership. We have investors from all over the world, Japan, Switzerland, Germany, South America, Chile in particular, the United States, Canada, the UK, Scotland. That's Sonna. Thank you. So now let's get into the, the challenge associated to taking those uh, wonderful innovations to the next level of, of scale and impact. And I just wanted to acknowledge also Astro, uh, who is there. Um, Astro is a uh, captain of Moonshot, is his job title. So he's pretty suitable for this conversation uh, for Max. And he will be um, coming in the conversation a bit later, posing as uh, uh, you rather a challenge and then maybe sharing some, some perspective. So thank you for being there, Astro. So um, can I ask you, and, and please, um, those of you who feel uh, like going first, do so, but are investors, business leaders, policymakers, in your view, recognizing enough the importance and the needs and the part that climate innovation plays in our uh, attempt to address uh, the climate crisis? Brandy, you're shaking your head. Do you want to go first? <laughs> no, they're not recognizing the need at all. And I think from our experience, uh, it's still viewed as being high risk. 
and yet we know how vitally important this is. Um, particularly when we're talking about emerging markets. Philip Hildebrand of BlackRock yesterday was just talking about how vitally important it is to invest in emerging markets, and particularly in climate change solutions. And yet, I feel like in our experience, investors still see us as being too risky. We're hardware and combined software, and we're working in emerging markets. And so there's still this hesitancy to dive in, uh, and I think that 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 really needs to be filled. Um, we need to start really capitalizing on, on the opportunity and the need. Because, I mean, the narrative seems, everybody seems to say it in words. What, what, is, how do, what do you attribute the disconnect between uh, action and words? And, and please, uh, feel free to jump in. Well, I think the, the risk factor is always present because when we talk about what we do, I mean, I mean we've, had, we've been audited by other scientists uh, to, to say that uh, what we do works, but then when we get to government funding or when we get to investors, they're saying, yes, what you're doing is very interesting, but let's, please come back when you have proven that it works. And so it's a never-ending game because, we, you know, we have to start first and then uh, we can expand and we are quite confident about what we can do, but we also observe that money is being invested in many ventures outside of climate tech and with some losses. So why not take this leap of faith with something so vital for the planet and, you know, hope for the best. So, yeah, it's, it's really There's a mindset, paradoxical. mindset shift. Right. Uh, yeah. Hank, do you want to talk to that? Yes, yeah, I mean, it, my view is that we need to develop a framework that encourages cross-border investment and de-risk the situation for all of us. Uh, one, you need to have the government de-risk investing and supporting these technologies. From the standpoint of the investors, investors must be willing to invest and support technologies that are, shall we say, um, are more technically uh, ready, if you will, uh, and earlier than they ordinarily would. And then lastly, we need to be willing to support the universities and encourage further and faster commercialization so that that allows the government and as well uh, investors to support technologies and scale them. So it's just a, a whole ecosystem of actors mm -hmm. that you want stronger alignment around. That's right. Yeah. Bumi. Um, for one, I think a lot of people... I think you need to speak up a little bit. Okay, no problem. Yeah. I think a lot of people do not invest in Africa, as for starters. And we can start there. There are a bunch of reasons why. And I think all of those reasons are being exacerbated by climate, climate change. What's that? Ah, there was... Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so all these problems are being exacerbated by climate change. So people don't want to invest in Africa. Um, people don't want to invest in youth. I'm 25 years old. Um, and I have these conversations and no one is ready to, you know, put their money where their mouth is. I've spoken to impact funds and they say, you know, well, you know, what's the return? When can we get, when can we exit? When, how much profit? When are you going to, you know, turn a profit? As opposed to how much, you know, how many people are you going to help? How many lives are you affecting? And I think the truth is um, solutions like this do have a lot of economic benefit. And I think we need to change how we see that. It might not be tomorrow, it might be in two years, three years, five years, but I think looking in the long term, we need to change that you know, short term um, capitalist approach to investing and look more to the longer view. You know, how do we change ecosystems? How do we change environments? How can we actually affect change and build you know, actual sustainable wealth and growth in countries like Nigeria? Sophie, can I ask you a question? Please. So remember, we were just talking about the idea that when it comes to places like Africa, you have the opportunity to, to deploy technologies that are at the cutting edge of the cutting edge. Exactly. Would you mind elaborating on that? Because fintech's a great example. Exactly. So there's a lot of focus on fintech. And it's something that I, um, I think about a lot because people have seen that it works and people know like fintech, mobile money. We have companies like Paystack in East Africa. Mobile money is huge. It's so much more efficient than you know, transacting in the US, for example, or even here. And we've proven that we can innovate and we need to show, or well, we need to incentivize innovation, not just in FinTech, because that's where people rush, because they've seen that's where the money is. But we need to show in clean tech and ag tech that, you know, we can also attract talent and innovate there as well. 
And I think once people realize that, you know, there's a lot of economic potential, a lot of social benefit as well, then, uh, you know, everything will change. Can I just ask you a follow-up question? You alluded to the context of climate change mm -hmm. um, really being very visibly impacting uh, the areas where those innovations are coming, coming up. Do you see that as being an impediment that people seeing, you know, the, the fact that um, um, the region in which you operate already dramatically impacted by climate change is actually an impediment in itself to generate the potential for those innovations. It's, yeah, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Is it, that's right. And um, at the moment, yes, climate change really does exacerbate everything, even from security to... What you could think that is exacerbate the need for innovation and the desire mm -hmm. to invest I mean, in those. It, it does make it harder to invest. And I think, you know, if you keep waiting, it's only going to become more exactly. difficult. So I think, you know, now people talk about, you know, people tell me, you know, that what you're doing is the future. And I, that, I don't like that because I think, you know, we're in, a, we're in an emergency. It's a crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's right now. It's a pressing issue. It's not the future. It's the right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to act now as opposed to 10 years down the line. We don't want to look back and be like, oh, oh my God, I wish we, I wish we, you know, thought right. about, thought about investing here. No, it's important right now. Yasmin? Yeah, I, I was, I just wanted to say that. But when I come to you afterwards, yeah. Sorry. Um, beyond the, the, the governments and policies and investors, there's another thing that could be a game changer for us is to have customers. You know, um, many companies are saying they want to commit to climate change, mm -hmm. uh, but you have to buy the products from clean techs, you know, go for off-take agreements, long-term agreements, because many of these companies, and that's our case, can be profitable, and uh, this can help with uh, finding money, but you need to have the customers. For example, example, we can produce activated carbon and carbon black at cheaper than the market right now where they are produced from fossil sources and using fossil fuels. So if we found off-takers for that, um, it would be much easier to go and find uh, uh, commercial bankings or things like that. So you also have to have customers that say, okay, I'm, I want to, to do my part and I'm going to uh, leave a place for uh, a net zero product and, and, and encourage clean techs that way. So. And what, what does that call for, in your view, to bring that consumer base? Customer base. I, I wish I had the answer because for me it makes total sense that you could have maybe, you know, uh, marketplaces for uh, net zero products so uh, you have a channel where you go and people can know uh, how many outputs you can turn out and, and buy it and at, and at probably very competitive prices but they have to make this choice to go from fossil-based product to clean products. Talk to Amazon, uh, Hank. Uh, ben, uh, actually, Hank, uh, Ben first, yeah, and then Hank, you can come back to it. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. And I think uh, I fully agree with my fellow panelists that uh, there needs to be a mindset shift. Uh, and we can't even really learn uh, from the fact that, as I mentioned, that uh, majority of farmers in Africa are small. And uh, for us to be able to reach out to these farmers who are the hardest hit by the impact of climate change, we really need to do something and we need to support the innovations. And sometimes, uh, similar to what the other panelists say, is that when you talk about smallholder farmers, people feel like these are poor people. But sometimes I wish I would say these are the, the richest people because they are the people with the land. And what they need is just support and the right support to be able to farm profitably in their farms for them to be able to succeed. So, and I, even when I was listening to the speeches from our world leaders when we were opening the conference, there was an, a general agreement that uh, things are already happening, but they are not happening as fast as is needed. And I think we just need to do things faster, we need to support these innovations so that we can be able to scale faster and be able to reach uh, to more farmers and help these innovations to be able to scale. Thank you, Ben. Hank. So, so I think this goes back to my earlier point about de-risking the, the framework that allows, I would argue, having large strategic partners come in and support uh, technology sooner and faster is critical here. In part, you know, one, they have the customers. They can scale and help you scale uh, at an accelerated rate. Yeah. And somehow setting up a system, whether 
with the government, however you want to describe it, uh, such that large corporations say, it makes sense for me to support you. Mm -hmm. It makes sense for me to support you or you, or obviously ourselves. That's what's critical here. And whether it's economic incentives, whatever it takes that encourages this to happen is needed. Hank, can I build on that really quick too? Please, because there's some please. interesting ties, I think, absolutely in terms of strategic partnerships, but that also dovetails into, Yasmin, what you were talking about of, of really working with how we, how we make some of those connections. That's right. And it feels like there's still this siloed approach, mm -hmm. right, where it's like, FinTech is over here, ag tech is well, over here, clean tech is over here, and all of that needs to break down right. because, as Bomi was saying, the clock is ticking. We've got 10 years to start really pushing the needle, so we've got to get creative with that, and that goes hand in hand with the capital that we're working with. So it isn't a matter of public funds, private sector funds. How can the two work together, right. and how can public funds de-risk some innovative projects to be able to incentivize public or private uh, investors to be able to come in and be able to make a return. Um, and how does that work exactly, Benjamin, with what you're doing with making sure that smallholder farmers have the tools and that connection point for profitability too. So I think we have to be really creative in how we are making a lot of those ties so that we could and accelerate. Any ideas? How do, we, how do we do that, Brandy? How do we break those silos? Oh, what I is it? Is it policy? Is it? You know, I, I think policy is slow. For me, that's just my, <laughs> my, my opinion. I think it's more of a matter of like, right, Bomi, how do you and I work together? How do I reach out to MasterCard and say, okay, right. Farm From A Box needs a digitized market access? Or how do I work with Benjamin? And we just forge these alliances and we show people on the ground, this is how we can do it. Well, so. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one thing I've been focused on is, is the intersection of innovation from across sectors and, and having that effort where everyone sees the opportunities in other people's sectors and is willing to share, yeah. not just across sectors, but I think globally. So someone may come up with a technology in Brooklyn, New York, for instance. Well, you should be able to easily talk, talk to someone in Guadeloupe or Nigeria or whichever, uh, uh, and encouraging that Absolutely. kind of global cross-border connection is what we all need to do. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, one thing I found in my experience is that some technologies may be tremendously useful here, but not in their home country. But right. somehow, some way, we must be, have an exchange that allows that to happen, where we can identify technologies that mm -hmm. are perfect for you, yeah. perfect for net zero in that location, but can be applied and supported from over here. That's where we're going to have to go. The, the world much is, more efficient system, in a way. Exa exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then what's going to have to happen is that we are going to have to encourage what I was cross-border or cross-Atlantic, and the example I give you is one of our largest and, and, and best investors, if you will, uh, and most supportive investors is from Chile. It's from? Chile, who's actually here the, today. And that's what I'm talking about, being able to look across the globe and find opportunities and support them and having the systems in place to encourage that, no matter where you are. There's something that um, I think very hard to believe, but I mean, it's, it's what I've been seeing these last years is how, you know, uh, big players that could really, you know, make a difference seems to um, just manage the time. I mean, they know they have time for themselves to apply the technologies when they see fit. And so when you're a smaller company and you're, you've developed something, something science-based, like uh, Hank was that. saying, you know, and... Uh, time is of the essence. Yeah, and you're ready. You yeah. can do it now. But for these companies that are already have vested interest in, in you know, uh, making the best of their investment, they have the time. And you, when you come, you don't have the time. So I think it's really essential to be able to bring these new technologies to the market as soon as possible because they are there. Mindset shift, urgency. Uh, Astro, can I bring you into the conversation at this point? And uh, how do we bring speed and scale to these potential of moonshot innovations? Um, let me start by saying I'm so grateful for entrepreneurs like you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I'm going to say two or three things that are going to sound less supportive, and it's not <laughs> because you're not great entrepreneurs. Keep doing what you're doing, sincerely. But I'll start by observing that since this conversation started, the word moonshots has showed up zero times in this conversation. And it's... And 
Each of you has maybe, if you're lucky, a 1% chance of building something that really changes the world mm -hmm. at the level of fixating nitrogen or mm -hmm. creating photovoltaics or something like that. Right. That's okay. You're still great entrepreneurs. The con as you've all observed, the context in which you're in is not allowing for you to go really have that level of audacity and that level of exploration. It's not about whether you might, in, in a different context, have you just aren't allowed to do that. So my challenge to you is, I am How audacious could you be? And then if you were trying to verify, is my thing the 1% that's like that? And if not, I'll just stop it and I'll try again. What is that radical learning you would do over the next year that either says, wow, there's a 2% chance, or no, it's not one of those 1% things, I should stop. So maybe respond to that and then I have a suggestion. C can I, before yeah. um, I'm giving them some thinking time on your challenging question, can you define moonshot in your, in your world? Well, I would say in order for something to be a moonshot, there has to be a huge problem in the world that you want to solve. There has to be a science fiction sounding product or service mm -hmm. that is super unlikely to really make that problem go away. But if it could be made, it would solve that problem. And then some breakthrough technology, which however unlikely it is to make that science fiction sounding product or service real, gives us a tiny chance, a testable hypothesis that we try, either it doesn't work, fine, we throw it away, or it gives us an extra glimmer of hope and we continue down the path. That's how I would describe it. Thank you. I think that's useful. Hopefully that's useful. You go ahead. I actually disagree. I think, um, <laughs> you know, we talk about technology and we talk about, if we talk about, you know, huge problems, I think, for example, we talk about poverty redu reduction, you know, hunger. The, you know, the, we don't necessarily need science fiction um, innovations. These things might exist already. They might be being ignored. Again, you, changing the way people think. That might be science fiction, changing the way the world thinks. That might be science fiction. It's tough to do that. But you know, how do we, reducing poverty, uh, reducing hunger, those are things that I think you can achieve without necessarily, you know, not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but there are ways to do that. And it, it really is just like a whole mindset shift. And I think what we do, for example, there's so many issues, uh, it, food inflation, hunger, conflict, and I think we help to assuage all of that. But like you said, you know, the 1%, do we need just one person being the 1% or is it better to have, you know, 1 million entrepreneurs doing their, their bit? Do we need to, do we really need to fixate on, you know, that 1%? Because like you said, it's, you know, it's not much chance. And as well, I think a lot of people see entrepreneurs as competing, especially because of finance. You compete for finance, so I have to be better than him and him and her. But I think it's better to view it as we're building a toolkit of technologies and methods that we can use to combat, mitigate, and adapt to, to climate change, as opposed to competing. I don't, I don't see these people as com competitors. I see them as partners and potential collaborators. They're not my competition. I can learn from them. Hopefully, they can learn something from me. And you know, I don't know if I've properly answered your question or challenge, but you know. I mean, you what sound like I a fantastic entrepreneur. I'm not taking <laughs> an issue with you as an entrepreneur, but I was describing separately that there are, if, if Yasmin can make mm -hmm. hydrogen at $2 a kilogram, yeah. she will have a great business. Right. If she can make it at 30 or 40 cents a kilogram, she will change the world. Right. And there's a difference between those. The first is not bad, but there's something important about the second which we should also be working towards. Yeah. I, I actually have a little bit of a different lens on that, Astro, and I appreciate um, the 1% in this context, but I, I see it a little bit differently because of, of any entrepreneur that's choosing to be in the impact space, we basically live in that 1% chance, right? We live in the house of audacity. We are going for it full force because otherwise we would choose to do a startup in something else, something easier. So if we have that 1%, we're going full force for it. Uh, and I think we have to, at this point in time, be as audacious as we possibly can. 
So if there's 1% chance, that's 1% closer than we would have been to actually addressing some of these challenges. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that there's an agreement there because there, there being is. an entrepreneur in the impact space and trying to solve some of these intractable challenges uh, is not easy, but we gotta, we gotta press on it. Yeah, I, I would say, like, like Bomi said, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying about changing the whole world with one solution, although I'm not really sure that exists. But for, for some places, um, you, you won't have one solution fits all. So maybe sure. you're going to be a moonshot for some certain contexts. Mm -hmm. And so you have, if you have a solution, well, you have to bring it out there and offer it and try to make a difference. I mean, I'm pretty confident we could go for the gigaton of uh, CO2 reduction just by answering the needs of islands and isolated territory, and we want to go there because I think uh, one gigaton less of CO2 emission each year is a good thing for the Earth. Am I going to be the only one to do it? Am I going to do it in how long am I going to do it? I don't know, but I want to go there because I know I can do it with this technology. So, so Astra, I look at this a little differently. I, I think in the net zero space, if you will, so many of the technologies that are in the market have been tested by science time and time and time again. Use our products at SunAmp. We've gone through a, almost a decade or so cycle testing of our product, et cetera, deployment of it, and so on. So we know that we can be impactful. And many of these folks do as well. Almost every single one of these companies, like that, all of the companies up here, have gone through significant science-based testing that gets them to the market. That's why we are where we are. So I would argue that they would, we really, are near that 1% of what you're talking about. We wouldn't be at this point in other sectors, but we are now here because we've tested, we have science that backs, quite frankly, our investment thesis in many cases. Now it's a matter of the community, the world adopting the technologies and us having the ability and the passion, if you will, to scale. That's really what's, what's the issue here. I, I, don't, I think that the technologies are appropriate. I think the technologies can be deployed, and as you said, not, it's not one size fits all. There, there's some technologies that'll be better for over here than mm -hmm. over here and so on. So I, I, I take a different approach than, than your question, if you will. Ben, you want to... Sorry. Yeah, just want something there, which I see here with my fellow partners, is that we need innovations and technology to be able to solve some of these problems. Sorry. When we, when we were starting Apollo, people never thought like we'd be able to make money serving a small older farmer doing less than one acre and so on. When we are able to do that through technology that, we, uh, that I described earlier in terms of trying to lower the cost of serving these customers. Because we already know that farmers are still, especially in Africa, producing way less, almost 10 to 20% of what the US farmers are producing. But how do we address these challenges? We know this is driving demand for more land and also uh, deforestation. But how do we drive technology that help us to address some of these challenges and be able to support these smallholder farmers to be able to farm comfortably and address the issues of climate change? I still believe that uh, the, the, the innovations that is happening right now, if there is good support, the mindset uh, shift uh, that we talked about, we should be able to see us scaling and be able to reach to more farmers who are, as I say, highly exposed to climate change. So, um, Astro, I'd love you to respond, but what I'm hearing is that maybe that sort of moonshot mindset is sort of an impediment mm -hmm. to, you know, addressing the need of people and planet for people like those entrepreneurs. Right, and I completely support you as entrepreneurs. I think you're doing <laughs> great as entrepreneurs. So I'm not taking any issue with the entrepreneurship that you guys are driving. I think that's fantastic. And what I would come back to is all of the panelists highlighted in one way or another that the context in which they're in for finding uh, partnerships and for getting investment is somewhat disconnected from their aspirations, from the ways and reasons that they want to pursue these things. Mm -hmm. So the challenge that I have now is not actually to the entrepreneurs, but to the investment world. We need to create different mechanisms that allow Such purpose and profit to be brought together better to allow technologies to be explored 
and rolled out so that we have the, the time to change the world. That's right. Um, I That's think right. it's possible, That's right. and these people are not being given that opportunity yeah. because the investment community, you know, is set up the way it's set up, and it's just malfit for the ways they're trying to help the world. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Astro, for that Great. welcome challenge. Great job. Keep doing it. <laughs> Thank you, Astro. <laughs> and I love what Yasmin said uh, about, you know, it's not one size fits all. It's all great to have those moonshot technology, but how do we deploy them so that everybody has access to them and sure. they actually meet the needs of the people? So I want to open the floor to uh, some virtual questions that we have received. And then I want to finish with all of you painting a world, a view of what a scaled up version of your innovation might look like. Give you some thinking time on that one. Great, we have some questions from the floor. Um, virtual floor, sorry. Uh, how can people be allies and support this initiative on an individual level? Say that again. The question is how can people be allies and support these sort of initiatives on individual levels? I think the easiest way is to amplify. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the easiest thing to do. It doesn't cost you anything. You know, amplify wherever you are, social media. Uh, in conversation, just talk about it, let people know. I think that's the easiest way. It's, it's back to your point of building a marketplace. Right. Uh, yes, th there's that, and uh, one of the things we've been thinking at some time is if government can see it, if investors can see it, the people can see it, you know? It's like a form of economic activism. If you have uh, green funds from uh, individual uh, initiatives, uh, that would need to be helped with probably external scientists to say, okay, this is worthwhile, this is the impact this can have, and people could put their money there and make things happen without the same, uh, you know, uh, um, blockage or, or risk uh, analysis that investors of government have. You know, if people, we want to do that. This is what we want for ourselves. We want the waste to be recycled in a way that makes sense. We want to pay less for energy. We don't have to, you don't want to have the CO2. So we're funding that ourselves. I mean, this could be something in the future. One point I'd add, on the individual level, I think that all of us should be willing to adopt new products and new technologies. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us to try something new, if it's proven it's better, it reduces our carbon footprint, whatever the case may be. That's, that's what I, I ask all of us to do. And the individual level ends up making up the masses. Precisely. So yeah. that's something that I that's really precise. enjoy about yeah. that precise. question precise. too, is sometimes we feel small as an individual, but as a collective, um, then suddenly, you know, we're, we're a sand dune that can completely really move and shift things. So it is a matter of like, be those early adopters of things, amplify these things, ask for them. Uh, and I think that, that makes a huge difference. That's right. Great, we only have five minutes left. There is maybe one question for this gentleman here, and then I really want to go close with each of you. Thank you. Um, this is Richard Harrington from the Natural History Museum. Uh, we heard yesterday about the, um, the fiduciary restrictions on uh, investment moving into emerging markets, and I wondered how much of that affects the kind of work that, that you guys are doing. And I just wondered, is that really a barrier to escalating, the, you know, getting the pace going on all of these new initiatives? I think it's a great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first because um, it, this is something that we're in the middle of right now. Um, we're now, Farm From A Box is starting to look at how our system can be deployed as a supply chain solution. How can we drop in and be able to basically activate a new agricultural value chain? And in order to do that and serve the populations that we're wanting to serve, there's no way that they'd be able to afford this infrastructure. So we're now looking at developing these innovative finance models where, again, we're kind of looking at catalytic capital and, and having public funds be able to come in and de-risk getting the infrastructure into place so that we can then work, as Yasmin said, with off-takers to right. be able to say, okay, we've got off-takers now that are willing to be able to provide a revenue to all of the farmers um, and basically bring in private sector funds and investment. But it's a little bit of a balance and there's still some exploration in this area. There's great organizations like Convergence Capital that's really looking at to doing um, innovative finance models. So it's getting there, it's getting there, but it is a challenge. Great, thank you for that question. So, if we can start with you, Ben. 
Um, I'm going to use the word moonshot. What is the moonshot potential of your innovation? If you project yourself in the future, what your innovation at scale could look like? And, and just be ambition and, uh, ambitious and make us dream in 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, very good question. So what I'll say is that at Apollo Agriculture, we are going to build a, uh, an operating system for agriculture. A solution that will be able to protect farmers, not only in Kenya, but uh, uh, Africa at large, from the impact of climate change, but also empower these farmers to go We believe this system will be able to help these farmers uh, get access to the food and products, and the financing that they need to be able to grow their income, but also as we drive a sustainable and commercial business in a sustainable and profitable way. So that is what I would say in terms of the dream of the media. Thank you, Ben. Han, can I go to you? So for our company, I think our moonshot is replacing 100% of the water heaters on this planet. That is our goal. We have a, a, a technology that can effectively do that, and uh, we're well on our way. To doing that. And in terms of impact, can you paint a picture? Well, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Often people focus on electrical waste and so on. Our goal is to decarbonize heat, and uh, that's what our goal is globally. Completely. Thank you. Yasmin? Well, um, I think the, the idea of contributing to one gigaton uh, of uh, CO2 reduction per year is something that we would really be happy to, to be helping the world with and it would be like uh, offering energy for half a billion people around the planet. So, you know, uh, using the waste and providing energy for half a billion people and reducing the, the CO2 emission by one gigaton per year would be something we would be really proud of. And paint a picture of the impact on the people that could have. Well, uh, with the, way, the, the many streams of waste that we can uh, recycle, we have impact on the uh, health of the people. Uh, we reduce uh, landfills and reduce uh, yeah, health issues. So, and we create jobs because it's a local uh, development uh, tech, um, a process. So we create jobs, we save the waste problem, we offer uh, affordable energy. So yeah, that's the kind of I mean, way I we can I think that's help. an interesting picture of those core cool benefits, planets and people, which yeah. I wanted yeah. you to tell about me. Um, I have the picture of uh, food sufficient energy, self-sufficient Africa with zero waste. That's what I want to achieve. That's what I want to catalyze with building power refineries, waste management, where you valorize, capture all that value and feed it back into the economy. Um, we don't have, there, we, I don't waste anything on our, on our site and I want to extend that to the whole Nigeria and Africa at large. I don't see anything as waste. Let's capture the value and let's keep that going. And again, on the impact on the continent. The impact, on again, like food sufficiency and abundance. And, and I think Africa can feed the world. I think Africa can, power, we have the potential and we just need to unlock that. Thank you. Tony? Well, Farm From a Box is working to build a global interconnected ecosystem of smart farms so that we could really elevate smallholder farming and local farming to be competitive on a global level and really work with digitization for that. And, and I haven't, I can't not say this, but we want to elevate not only local farmers to be able to mitigate the challenges of, of climate migration so that these um, rural areas are really fortified against climate change, but elevate women farmers in particular uh, because they do not have the access and that's the great multiplier effect. So we're really working to make sure that we're uplifting uh, localized farming globally. Can you expand on the multiplier effect of women farmers? I, women don't have access to the technology, they don't have access in to training. In terms of impact. impact yeah. Oh, the impact uh, in terms of Women, uh, the, 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 you, you said about the accelerating potential of women uh, being empowered in driving that kind of action. I think women, women farmers are the ecological gatekeepers of our future, but also of our markets. Um, so if we fully include them and be able to use technology to really uplift and bring them into the market, I think that's the game changer right there. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much uh, to all of you. You've been selected by you know, Edinburgh University for your potential for scale, for impact. And, and again, it's interesting to 
hear you talking about the challenges you face, considering um, you know, who you are and the achievement you're having already with your innovation. So I think that was a sobering. But also, I think you, you brought some interesting perspective on solution about de-risking the framework, creating a marketplace where we increase the demand, shifting the mindset with more urgency, and um, um, around the, the need to finance uh, the kind of innovation that you are behind. A challenge from you know, Astro that I think was very interesting is, um, is the 1% moonshot. It's, it's, it is what we need now, considering we, the nine years we have left to, uh, to tackle the climate crisis. So I think it was a fascinating conversation. So thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you, Astro, for your challenge and advice. And thank you for all of you for your participation. So please join me in thanking uh, our speakers. I just um, would like to invite you all uh, to join us in the yard where we have an innovators uh, networking moment at 10.30, right after this session. So in the yard, which is the tent, uh, the right tent on the side, many more innovators will be there as well to join you. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.